Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 54, Skylab Launch. Last time, we introduced America's first space station, Skylab. This giant beast of a spacecraft was created by adapting an S-4B upper rocket stage, resulting in a vehicle with sophisticated attitude control, electricity generation, an airlock, numerous scientific instruments, and ample room for crew activities. The spacecraft was so large that only the mighty Saturn V, or at least two-thirds of it, was up to the task of lofting it up into low Earth orbit. Today, we'll be getting into some of the details on the science goals of Skylab, as well as its launch and initial checkout of its onboard instruments. Science was the name of the game when it came to Skylab. While the moon landings had been about dominating the Soviet Union and the space regime, with a little science on the side, when it came to Skylab, science was the whole point. So it should come as no surprise that the spacecraft was filled to the brim with scientific equipment and experiments. There were a lot of experiments on Skylab, but let's hit on some of the more notable ones, following the same path as our original tour from the last episode. I'll just touch on these lightly as a quick tour, since we'll be getting more in-depth on most of these during the actual missions. Starting at the bottom of the orbital workshop, just outside the crew's personal quarters and the wardroom, were three experiments dedicated to learning more about how long-duration spaceflight affects the human body. First, the ergometer, which is basically just an exercise bike but without a wheel. This served two purposes. First, it gave the astronauts a way to exercise muscles that otherwise wouldn't get much work in zero gravity. Second, it allowed scientists to study any changes in the astronauts' metabolism by having them work out and monitoring their heart rate and breathing. The effects of zero gravity on the body had been studied in previous flights, but it was almost always after the fact. With Skylab, data could be collected regularly during the flight while allowing astronauts to stay fit. Next, the lower body negative pressure experiment. One of the issues with long duration spaceflight is that your heart doesn't have to work as hard as it does on Earth. There's nothing pulling the blood down to your legs, making it easier to pump blood around, allowing the heart to sort of slack off a bit. This can make readjusting to gravity at the end of a stint in space a challenge. The lower body negative pressure experiment was a sort of iron lung-like device that would help scientists quantify how much of a slacker the heart was becoming and maybe make readjustment to gravity easier. Imagine a long barrel with flexible material on top with a hole in it. An astronaut would slip his legs into the barrel and cinch the flexible material tight around his chest, resulting in his head, arms, and shoulders being outside of the device and his legs inside. Once in place, the device would lower the air pressure inside the barrel by as much as 15 to 20 percent. With lower air pressure pushing up against his skin, the astronaut's legs would expand slightly, resulting in more volume for blood, which pulled more blood down into the lower extremities. A cuff around his leg would measure exactly how much expansion took place. Each astronaut did this every three days. Combined with other data, it painted a helpful picture on how the cardiovascular system changed in the microgravity environment. Also, the placement of the barrel up against the wall makes me think it looks like they're about to launch the astronaut off the station like a torpedo. The next experiment was a rotating chair that I'm not entirely convinced wasn't some sort of prank on the Skylab crews. Once NASA moved into the Apollo era and astronauts weren't stuffed into their spacecraft with a shoehorn, problems with motion sickness began to emerge. It turned out that more room on a vehicle gave you enough room to feel really disoriented and sometimes nauseous. Being sick to your stomach is never fun, but in space it can be a real liability. For one thing, the time an astronaut spends puking would be better spent furthering the goals of the mission. But as Rusty Schweikart showed us on Apollo 9, zero-gravity nausea can also be dangerous. Vomiting in a space helmet is super duper gross, but could also result in just about one of the worst deaths imaginable if it became impossible to breathe in there. So NASA wanted to get a handle on what caused space sickness and how the vestibular system adapted to weightlessness. With that in mind, this awful rotating chair was included on the flight. An astronaut would sit on the chair with their eyes closed while spinning at various speeds. During this, they'd try to maintain a sense of direction, and presumably a sense of stomach strength. Moving upstairs, we find another experiment designed to help study the crew, the body weight device, 
This is part of a slew of experiments that were trying to ascertain not just what happened to the human body during long stays in space, but when. For example, let's say an astronaut returns to Earth weighing 10 pounds less than when they left. An important question would be when that happened. Did they lose it in their first day? Does it progress linearly over the course of the flight? Do they stay at their usual weight until day 35 and then suddenly start losing mass rapidly? By measuring their body mass regularly during the flight, the crew would quantify the changes over time. But how do you measure body weight in weightlessness? It's sometimes easy to forget down here on Earth, but there is a difference between weight and mass. An astronaut in orbit is weightless, but they still have plenty of mass. And since your weight is just a function of your mass and the gravitational field that you're in, once you know an astronaut's mass, you know what their weight on Earth would be. And determining mass in space is something we can do thanks to good old Isaac Newton. Basically, have the astronaut sit on a spring-loaded apparatus, unlatch it, which allows the whole thing to gently spring forward, and then measure how fast that happens. You know the force because you built the spring, you measure the acceleration, and from there you get the mass. F equals MA. On either side of the orbital workshop were two small scientific airlocks. These were placed so that when Skylab was in sunpoint mode, one would be facing the sun, and one would be facing away from the sun. These are pretty much just what they sound like. Just small square airlocks about a foot across that the astronauts could stick experiments through. Easy access to the space environment is a handy thing to have. Positioned in the multiple docking adapter were a suite of six instruments that together made up the Earth Resources Experiments Package, or EREP. The EREP was a collection of cameras and sensors that were dedicated to studying the Earth from orbit. Observations would be made with visible light cameras, infrared light cameras, as well as radiometers that could measure the amount of energy being reflected off of the Earth. What made the EREP special is that since there was a crew on board to operate it and collect data, more data could be collected faster than an automated spacecraft at that time. I'm a fan of the EREP since it reminds me a lot of the Earth-observing satellites I work on these days. The Earth terrain camera especially reminds me of a weird manual version of the MODIS instrument that flies on board Terra and Aqua. And when I say manual, I mean it. The camera actually had to be installed in the Earth-facing scientific airlock in the orbital workshop by hand whenever they wanted to collect data. Other than the Earth terrain camera, the EREP instruments were all placed in the multiple docking adapter, and that's where they were controlled by the crew. The third pillar of Skylab science, along with life sciences and Earth observation, was solar and space science. This one was a pretty big deal. Humans had obviously studied the sun since basically forever, but even with modern instruments, there's only so much you can do from the planet's surface. If you really want to learn more about the sun, you need to get above that pesky atmosphere. Well, Skylab had that covered. Scientists were excited to get some detailed, long-term observations of the sun in a wide variety of wavelengths using a bunch of specialized instruments. Most of these were situated in the Apollo telescope mount, where they could benefit from a dedicated power source and special attitude control systems, but some were elsewhere around the laboratory. Since I think getting into each and every one of these instruments would be a bit much, I'm just going to rattle them off to give you an idea of how much work was being done, and to see how many takes I need to say them all right in one go. We've got a white light coronagraph, X-ray telescope, X-ray spectrographic telescope, ultraviolet scanning polychrometer, extreme ultraviolet spectroheliograph, ultraviolet spectrograph, hydrogen alpha telescopes, and of course ultraviolet, and x-ray solar photography. Only took me two ticks. One common theme you may notice is the focus on high-energy wavelengths such as ultraviolet and x-rays that don't make it to the Earth's surface. But our star wasn't the only one being studied. There were also a suite of instruments dedicated to stellar astronomy. Nuclear emulsions, ultraviolet telescopes, galactic x-ray mapping, and transuranic cosmic rays were all subjects of study. If this seems like a crazy amount of science, you're right, and I've only lightly touched on most of this. In all, there were nearly a hundred different experiments and scientific instruments on board. Skylab promised to deliver a staggering amount of unprecedented data and a huge variety of fields. But first, we need to get the thing into orbit. When May 14, 1973 arrived at the Kennedy Space Center, 
NASA was a different place than it had been just a few short years earlier. The mad dash to the moon was over, as were the impressive missions that followed Eagle to the surface. The space race had been decidedly won by the United States. The public had largely moved on. But some folks apparently didn't get the memo that space wasn't cool anymore, since over half a million people showed up to witness the final Saturn V launch. This Saturn V was notably different in appearance than its predecessors, with the slim, tapering Apollo spacecraft and launch escape system replaced with an enormous payload fairing. It was a beautiful day for a launch, mid-70 degrees Fahrenheit and some scattered clouds that might obscure the view but were no danger to the rocket. Among the people gathered to watch the launch were three men we'll get to know very well in the next couple of episodes. Pete Conrad, Joe Kerwin, and Paul Weitz, the first crew of Skylab. They were on hand to see their spacecraft off before their own ride to orbit the next day, where they'd rendezvous and dock with the space station about eight hours after liftoff. At 1.30pm local, five F-1 engines roared to life one last time. The sound suppression system doused the launch pad with a deluge of water. The engine spewed fire, smoke, and steam down the flame trench. The umbilical arms retracted, the hold-down post swung back, and Skylab was on its way. The vehicle smoothly passed the tower, turned to the proper launch azimuth, and began the long climb to orbit. Before long, those darn clouds got in the way, though, and the rocket was no longer visible. But telemetry stayed strong all the way to orbit, and the ascent was proceeding perfectly. There were a couple of odd blips on the telemetry, especially around the 63 second mark, but those are usually just instrumentation. S1C burnout, staging, S2 ignition, S2 aft skirt jettison, S2 burnout, and spacecraft separation, and Skylab was on orbit. Though there was another oddity at telemetry right as the S2 was backing away from the workshop. Just a little attitude transient, probably just related to the separation. But whatever, the orbital insertion looked perfect. Skylab was in almost exactly the desired orbit. The first order of business was to crack open the payload fairing and point the top of the workshop towards the sun, which kept the radiator in shadow where it could do its job better. Next, deploying the Apollo telescope mount. Again, the ATM started directly above the multiple docking adapter, in line with the rest of the workshop, so that it could fit inside the payload shroud. Once in space, it rotated 90 degrees to the side, exposing the primary docking port. Despite the mechanical complexity of this maneuver, the ATM deployed with no issues. Then the ATM solo arrays. Four long solar panels on the side of the ATM extended like a big space flower. No problem. The next command was to deploy the two main solar arrays. These are positioned on either side of the orbital workshop and stay tucked tight up against the main workshop body during launch. Once the command is issued, the solar panel wings rotate 90 degrees, and then the solar panels themselves extend out of them towards the rear of the spacecraft. By the time this command was issued, Skylab was already passing over Australia, where ground controllers confirmed Skylab had received the message. But the next time the ground came into contact with Skylab, something was amiss. The command to deploy the solar arrays had definitely been issued, but when ground controllers looked at the levels of electricity being generated, it wasn't at all what was expected. Each solar array was expected to generate about 6 kilowatts of power. Instead, solar array 1 was showing 25 watts, barely a trickle, and solar array 2 was showing nothing at all. Not only that, onboard temperatures had started to rise far more than expected. So, clearly something was wrong, but what exactly had happened? Putting yourself in the shoes of a mission controller, some of the questions that might go through your head would be, were these incidents related? Had something been forgotten in the design? Was something broken? If so, what was broken? Was it the computer that sent the command? The wire connecting the computer to the device? The device itself? When you're talking about an uncrewed vehicle, it's not like you can just ask someone to take a peek out the window and see what's going on. All you've got is the stream of telemetry to try to piece things together. And one piece of data can just raise more questions. For example, one solar array is showing 25 watts instead of the usual 6,000 watts. Could it be that the cover never opened, but there's a hole in it allowing light in? Maybe it did open, but something is between it and the sun. 
Maybe it tried to open, but only got part way there. Maybe there's a break in the electrical connection with most of the panels. Maybe it's just not pointed at the sun. It could be a ton of things. But once you combine it with other pieces of telemetry, you can start to figure out what might actually be going on. For instance, we know it must be pointed towards the sun since the Apollo telescope mount is getting power. Each new piece of data puts another piece of the puzzle in place. Once all the telemetry was examined, the situation seemed to be this. Solar Array 1 had partially deployed, but something was preventing a full deployment. Solar Array 2 had completely failed to deploy, or was maybe just gone. The meteoroid shield, which was also responsible for shading the orbital workshop, seemed to be missing entirely. Initial troubleshooting was unable to resolve the situation. Skylab was crippled. Thanks to the solar power being generated by the Apollo telescope mount, it was still able to limp by, but not indefinitely. The onboard temperature was far too high for human habitation, over 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and the power situation was dire. If the orbital workshop was allowed to cook in those temperatures for too long, all of the onboard food would spoil, and noxious fumes could outgas from the workshop walls, which had been designed for lower temperatures, and the experiments could be ruined. The station could be pointed away from the sun to cool it off, but then it would start to lose power, so ground controllers were forced to constantly switch back and forth using the attitude control thrusters. If the thruster system ran out of fuel, only the far slower control moment gyros would remain, and they needed power. In 2018 money, Skylab cost almost $12 billion, and from the ground, it looked like it could all be lost in one fell swoop. So, what's going on here? Why is everything falling apart? I could be mean and make you, my dear listeners, live with the mystery just like the ground controllers did, and only tell you what happened when the astronauts arrive and can report back themselves. So, next time. Nah, I'm just messing with you, here's what happened. For the first 60 seconds of the flight, everything was great. Then things suddenly became not so great. As you'll recall, surrounding the main body of the orbital workshop was the meteoroid shield. I've come to visualize this as a sort of corset for the rocket. It was basically strapped on tight around its body during launch. Once in space, it would deploy several inches away from the main body. This both protected the station from orbital debris, but also managed thermal energy with its specialized paint job. About 60 seconds after launch, as the vehicle was right around the sound barrier but not quite yet at the period of maximum dynamic pressure, something came a little loose on the meteoroid shield. This shifted its position and allowed air to force its way in from the front of the rocket a second and a half later. A second after that, the forces proved to be too great and the main hinge failed, allowing the two halves of the shield to separate. You can kind of visualize this as the hood of your car opening slightly on the highway, the air getting under it, and then suddenly tearing the hood off all at once. And note that this is a physical failure, not an incorrect deployment command from the onboard computer. At this point, you have a giant flapping thing hanging off the side of your rocket, and nobody likes that. Review of the flight control system data confirms the presence of large unexpected roll maneuvers as the rocket struggled to continue on a nominal trajectory. As the shield came loose, it wrapped itself around Solar Array 2, yanking its restraints open in about a tenth of a second. The rest of the shield then unrolled as one chunk and departed the vehicle. But not for long, because two tenths of a second later it reconnected with the rocket, smashing into the adapter cone. That's the part of the Saturn V where it tapers in towards the third stage. Half a second later, the rest of the meteoroid shield wrapped itself around Solar Array 1, pulling part of the solar array structure over its protective cover before finally tearing loose completely and following the other half of the shield down to the Atlantic Ocean. As if all that wasn't enough, as the shield banged its way down the Saturn V, it also impacted the aft skirt of the second stage. This is a large ring that goes around the second stage engines and connects to the first stage. Normally, this would drop away 30 seconds after the second stage ignites. You may not realize it, but you're probably already familiar with this component. It's that big flaming ring falling towards the Earth you often see in Apollo footage. That particular footage was from Apollo 6, the second uncrewed test flight of the Saturn V. 
As the meteoroid shield fragments departed the launch vehicle, it damaged the system responsible for removing the aft skirt. So when the time came to cut it loose, instead of essentially unzippering around the full circumference of the skirt, it only made it part way around. This caused it to drop enough that onboard sensors believed the skirt had been jettisoned, so no alarm was raised in mission control. It remained loosely attached to the second stage all the way to orbit. Now you might be wondering, what's so important about getting rid of this big metal ring? It's important to keep in mind that stuff works a little bit differently at extreme altitude. In the super thin atmosphere the S2 operated in, the aft skirt remaining in place caused hot gases to stay in the vicinity of the engines. Once the center engine cut out, which happens about two minutes before the others, there was nothing pushing hot gases away from the center anymore. The result was steadily increasing temperatures right at the base of the second stage. In fact, had the burn gone on for much longer, there's a good chance it would have ruptured the base of the stage, and NASA would have lost its first Saturn V in flight. And Skylab. It was also bad because the aft skirt was heavy. Especially this one. That's because Skylab, as huge as it was, still weighed less than a fully loaded S-4B stage. To compensate for the change in mass, hundreds of pounds of lead ballast had been added to the S-2 aft skirt. So when the skirt failed to separate, the engines had to burn almost a second longer to deal with the extra mass. Good thing the Saturn V is a beast and had some performance in reserve. Incidentally, now you can tell your friends who enjoy space trivia about the time NASA accidentally launched several hundred pounds of lead into orbit. It happens. To cap off this ridiculous series of events, one last notable incident happened after main engine cutoff. When Skylab separated from the S-2, you didn't just want the S-2 lurking around where it could bump back into it. So four decently large, solid-fueled retro rockets were positioned around the front of the S-2. Skylab dropped off, and then these rockets fired to push the S-2 away. The rockets had been carefully placed to ensure that their plumes would not impinge on Skylab itself. Except, Skylab's configuration has changed a little. Remember how I mentioned that the meteoroid shield had torn Solar Wing 2's restraints loose? Yeah, now instead of being tightly held to the workshop body, it was just sort of hanging out there, partially deployed. Right in the path of one of the retro rockets. The retro rockets fired, the Solar Wing slammed back against its restraints, and then was just blasted out into space. The brief time it held on was what caused the unusual attitude transients observed around this time. All of this leaves us with a crippled space station and a crew that may no longer have a destination. But what can you do? You know the famous NASA saying, failure is probably the most likely option. No, no wait, the other thing. Failure is not an option. Sure, we don't have enough electricity and the thermal system is all wonky and we're going through weeks of attitude control fuel in a matter of days. Sure, no one has ever planned an on-orbit repair like this and there were no tools or training in place. And sure, there were only a matter of days to figure it out and get the crew up there or the whole project would be a loss. But we do not do this because it is easy, but because it is hard. Join us next time as we talk about the remarkable response to Skylab's troubled launch. Engineers across the country will scramble to come up with solutions, and the crew will scramble to learn how to implement them. And we'll get to sit back and enjoy some of the craziest stories in human spaceflight history. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.